Hello, so in this talk, I'm going to be speaking about the transformation of our interior life, the transformation of the heart, the transformation of the soul, the transformation of the mind, because God wants to transform us. He wants to bring out what is best in us. He sees the full potential of who we are. We don't always see it, but God sees it. And to do that, he needs to strip away from us what does not belong to us, the things that the world has added to us, because the world wants to recreate us in the world's image and likeness. And God has created us in his. So in order for us to become the full potential of who we are created to be, we need to surrender ourselves to God and we need to say, thy will be done. And so God comes to us and he purifies us. He takes us on this great adventure that we call our Christian life, our faith, our, what it means to be truly Catholic. And that is to let go of self so that Jesus can live within us so much more completely. Sometimes we're tempted to see God in materialistic things. So we want more and more and more. When God is not in those materialistic things, we see this in especially the book of Ecclesiastes where the wisest man in the world, King Solomon, he tried everything, but in the end he said it was a chasing after the wind. Notice in Pentecost that when the apostles were all together in the upper room with our blessed mother, what they heard was like a wind. In other words, the wind is the Holy Spirit. So, so here we have King Solomon chasing after the wind. He's chasing after the Holy Spirit, but he's looking for the Holy Spirit in all the wrong places. And in the end, King Solomon said, everything is vanity. Everything is empty because the wind, the Holy Spirit is not in the materialistic. It is in the spiritual. It is in the life of the church. It is in each one of us as God is in each one of us. So God wants to bring out what is best in each one of us. And that involves a stripping. We need to be stripped from the world. We need to be stripped from the desires of the flesh. We need to be stripped from everything within us that does not belong to us, that is not from God. So St. John of the Cross talks about this and he calls it the dark night of the soul. In a recent talk, I was speaking about the sin of acedia. The reason is it's, that it's a sin is because it's associated with one of the seven deadly sins, the sin of sloth. Because what acedia is, is us trying to get, God, get to God by our own strength, by our own effort, but we can't. And we end up disappointed, frustrated, angry, giving up on God, giving up on the Holy Spirit. We no longer see charity as something joyful. We no longer see suffering as a gift. We see everything to do with God as an inconvenience, but we cannot get to God by our own strength. We have to allow him to come to us. So God wants to bring us through these three stages of conversion. This is where he really works on the interior life. God doesn't want to just remove sin from us like you cut off the head of a weed, because what happens to that weed? It grows back. God wants to uproot that sin within us. When Jesus appeared to Saint Matilda and gave her his sacred heart, he told her, it's not enough just to hate sin. You also have to love virtue. So if you're struggling with the sin of lust, you need to love the gift of purity. And the way to do that is ask Our Lady, who has the gift of purity, Mary, give me that desire for purity. Give me that love for purity. Ask St. Joseph as well, because he's such a significant person in the church, the husband of Mary, who also had the gift of purity. And if you're struggling with the vice of impatience, ask God to give you the virtue of impatience. Whatever you're struggling with, ask God to give you the virtue, but help you to fall in love with that virtue so that you desire it even more. It's not enough to hate sin. We have to love virtue. Now, what happens as we enter into the very first stage of the interior life? The first stage is called the purgative stage. That reminds us of purgatory. That reminds us of purification. That reminds us of a certain level of suffering. As we enter into this stage, there is something that is going on within the soul, first of all. 
And the first thing that's going on is conversion. This is when somebody for the first time hears about the message of Jesus Christ. They're hearing the gospel. They're hearing that God is real. The greatest compliment somebody ever gave me was God is alive in you. Is God alive in you? Now, when you convert, when you turn your life around, when you let God in, when you say to Jesus, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do, now come on in and take control. When you do this, when your spiritual journey begins, God is very alive in you. He's very real. You experience him primarily through your emotions, through your feelings, through your sensations. And so everything is easy. You see God in the sun and the moon and the stars. You see God in the flowers. You see God in each other. You're praising to God with all your heart. You feel so close to God in prayer. You feel so close to God when you're praying and you're worshiping, when you go to mass. It's all largely feeling. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's how God blesses us. That's how God consoles us in the beginning of our conversion. But God is asking more from us. Notice you go on a retreat somewhere. It's a great retreat. And that's where maybe the conversion begins for many of us. But what happens soon after? Those feelings don't last very long. It's almost like the honeymoon period of our faith. And that's true for anyone who's on this road. Those feelings, those emotions don't tend to last for very long. It's easy to feel close to God and say that God is real, God is alive, I'm all about God, Jesus Christ is Lord. It's easy to say all that when you feel so close to God, but God doesn't want us depend, to depend upon our own feelings for his existence. God is more than our feelings. God is more than our emotions. You see, if we depend upon our emotions and sensations for God's existence, for God's nearness, if I feel God is near, God must be near, but then all of a sudden I don't feel God, so he doesn't exist. What am I really doing? Am I worshiping God or am I worshiping my own feelings, my own emotions? So if those emotions are not there, now I need to do whatever it takes to find those emotions. I need to maybe manipulate my life a little bit so that I can feel God. I need to pray until I feel close to God or hang around with the people who are gonna make me feel close to God or go on a retreat for that high but I'm really worshiping the high and I'm chasing the high, the spiritual high. But that will always give us a superficial faith if that's where we're gonna stay. God wants to draw us away from worshiping him with emotions only. He wants to draw us away from depending upon him with our own emotions because God is beyond our emotions. That's why a lot of people, especially the saints, complained of dryness of faith. This is how you know God is taking you deeper. Dryness of faith. Dryness of faith is an indicator that God is something, doing something now more profound within you. He's going deeper within you. He's uprooting certain habits, certain vices, certain sins within you. To do that, he needs you to stop worshipping your feelings. He needs to pull you away. This is the purgative stage this is the stage where God begins to strip you, beginning with your senses. God is stripping you of your senses, of your feelings, of an, um, your emotions for him. To do this, God withdraws himself from your emotions, from your feelings. He doesn't withdraw himself from you by his grace. He is still there. You just don't feel him. That's where faith goes to a whole new level because now I have to trust that God is still here and it's not because of anything I'm doing. It's not because I've been on a great retreat. Great retreats are great, don't get me wrong, but don't go to great retreats for the feeling. Go because it's for God. Don't go to mass because it's for the feeling. What happens when there's no feeling? The mass is boring because you're going for the feeling. Why do you struggle with adoration? Because you don't feel anything. Why do you struggle with prayer? Because you don't feel anything. It's not about the feeling. It's about allowing God to work within you in that moment. It's about God. Going to mass, believe it or not, it's not primarily about you, it's about God. Don't go to mass hoping to be entertained. It's not about being entertained. A lot of people would rather go to places of worship where they're gonna be entertained, where they're gonna feel good. But the highest form of prayer the church teaches is contemplation. Contemplation is where you don't 
you don't pray with God because you feel anything. Contemplation is where you just be with God. You enter into this mystical union with God. St. Teresa of Avila called it the mystical marriage, where you are just one with God. This is the goal of conversion. The goal of conversion through these stages is to love God the way God wants to be loved, the way God deserves to be loved, not the way I want to love God. God deserves to be loved the way he wants to be loved, which is unconditionally, which has got nothing to do with me. Right now in this first stage, the stage of purgation, you love God because you get something out of it. That's where it all starts for every single one of us. We love God because we gain something. We're loving one another because we gain something. We gain merit. We're being charitable because we get something from God. We get heaven. We get graces. We get gifts. We get, we get, we get. But the ultimate end of conversion, which is the unitive stage, that's when we are one with God and we love God. And it's not because we get anything out of it. It's just because we love God. We're created for God. And so we're just one with God, loving God. Do you think Jesus loves the Father because he gets something out of it? He loves the Father because he loves the Father. The Father loves the Son because the Father loves the Son. The Father, this eternal, infinite exchange of love is something that happens between them. And it's not because they're gaining something. When you love someone because you gain something, that's not unconditional love. That's conditional love. You have an agenda and you're going to manipulate that person to give you maybe what you want. So the purgative stage is God removes himself from the emotions, from the feelings. And you become less self-centered. You become more God-centered. In the beginning, the whole world, including God, re revolves around you. The sun revolves around you. But as time goes on, you begin to change so that you now revolve around God. Your world revolves around God. Everything about you revolves around God so that you are no longer the center of the universe. You are no longer the center of your world. Guess who is? Jesus Christ. He wants to be at the center of your world and the center of Jesus Christ is his sacred heart. And so you need to have his sacred heart at the center of your life. This is the process of conversion. So the second stage now, after you allow God to remove himself from your emotions. Remember, we're always trying to hold on to certain things, and especially our emotions, our sensations, our feelings, they become attachments that God wants us to let go. He wants us to surrender our own feelings, our own emotions to him. When we do that, then we enter more quickly into the next stage, a deeper stage, and that is the illuminative stage. This is where God now begins to work on our intellect. He begins to work on our mind. He begins to work on our soul at a deeper level. Because before, we could see God in all kinds of places, in all kinds of people. We've seen God in nature. We think about God. We see God in the Bible, in the, script, in the scriptures. So there's a certain enlightenment going on within the intellect. This time, God is going to pull himself away from the intellect. So we are in darkness. That's the dark night of the soul. The dark night of the senses, the dark night of the soul. And when God removes himself from the intellect, then we really have to have faith because we don't know where God is. God is still there by grace. Mother Teresa experienced this for 40 years of her life. St. Paul of the cross experienced this also for almost 40 years of his life. So the saints experienced this. St. Teresa of Lisieux, she experienced this towards the end of her life. So the saints experience this, but there is still a peace in there because God still gives his grace whenever we need it. But he's working on stripping us and he's stripping us of our intellect. He's stripping us of our mind so that we believe in him. We have faith in him. He's developing our trust. How is this different then to what I was talking about before? Acedia, Acedia, you're trying to get to God on your own strength. You can't. You have this dryness of faith, but it's only because you're, you're entering into despair, you're lacking confidence, you're lacking courage, you're giving up. That's the only reason for this dryness of faith. However, the dark night of the soul, the dryness of faith is because God is withdrawing himself from you. You are not withdrawing yourself from God. In Assyria, you are. 
but in the dark night of the soul, you're still trusting in God. You're allowing him to strip you of your emotions, your feelings, and your intellect. God now removes himself, but not completely. He returns. Notice in the beginning of your conversion, there are times when you feel close to God, but the times when you don't. That's because God is doing this. He's withdrawing himself, but then he's coming back, withdrawing and coming back. He's helping you by drawing you to himself. He wants you to get stronger in your faith. To do that, he has to draw it away so that you come after him. But some people, they give up. They haven't got the stamina. They can't persevere. They don't want it because it's too difficult. They want the faith easy. So God draws himself in order to build up our spiritual muscles so that we chase after him. We go deeper and we cry out to him and we really do want him. We desire him. And he wants us to desire him because that's what's best for us. So God withdraws himself now from our intellect. It's the constant letting go. This is, remember, it's about putting God at the center of our life. And in this stage, the stage of the dark night of the soul, it becomes very difficult to, to see God in anything, to see God in people, to see God in the sun, the moon, the stars, the hills, the valleys, the nature the flowers it's very good to see it's difficult to see god now with our intellect because he's removing himself from our intellect it's very difficult at this stage to meditate upon the mysteries of jesus meditate upon the mysteries of jesus in the gospel it's very difficult at this stage to see jesus in the gospel because your intellect now is in darkness it's going at a deeper level once you allow this to happen However long it takes, like I say, for many of the saints, it took a long time. For most of us, I imagine, we're going to be in this life and we're going to be stuck in the purgative stage. That's the whole point of purgatory in the next life, to give us that purification, to take us through these stages so that we end up in the ultimate stage, which is the unitive stage. That's where we see God face to face. We call it the beatific vision. Some of the saints have been luckily enough in this life or blessed enough in this life to enter into the unitive stage. You see it with Catherine of Siena. She had these raptures where God would take her soul out of her body. And many people thought she was dead because a soul separated from a body, the body is a corpse. And so many people thought that Catherine of Siena had died. Teresa of Avila was exactly the same. In fact, Teresa of Avila told people I'm going to experience a rapture. It's going to last a few days, but please don't bury me. You're going to think I'm dead. Even the doctor came out, checked the pulse, and she had no pulse. But they remembered what she said, and they didn't bury her, even though they were on the very verge. And eventually the soul came back to the body, and she explained what happened. Another saint, Saint Mariana, she's known for Our Lady of Good Success in Ecuador, in Quito. And she was a sister who became a mother superior in the convent. And she died. She went to see God. And God said to her, you can receive the crown of glory now and come straight into heaven. But your sisters in that convent, they're going to be condemned because of their sins. Or you can receive the crown of thorns and you can go back to that convent. But you're going to suffer for the rest of your life. But those, those sisters, they will be saved. You choose. And you know what she chose? She chose to go back. She chose the crown of thorns over the crown of glory. She went back. She went back. And in the convent, she really did suffer. She was imprisoned many times by her own nuns. She was forced to eat off the floor. She was flogged every day. She was imprisoned more than one occasion. She died many times. She was having this rapture, this mystical union with God, where she was in the unitive stage. She was one with God. That's what it means. The unitive stage is the beginning of an awakening. So there are two different types of awakening that John of the Cross talks about. The awakening is when you see God in the beatific vision, in this life, in the unitive stage, which many of the saints got to see. But there's a second awakening, and that's when we die, and we, re and we, we see God face to face as he really is. So here we have the purgative stage, the purification of the senses, the illuminative stage, the purification of the intellect, and then the unitive stage. The unitive stage is where we see God the way God wants to be seen, not because we're seeing God through nature or through um, other people or through the scriptures. This time, everything is actually reversed. 
When we are in the unitive stage, we no longer see God through people. We no longer see God through nature. We no longer see God through the scriptures. Instead, in the unitive stage, we see people through God. We see nature through God. We see the scriptures through God. Before, we've seen everything. We've seen God through everything. Now, in the unitive stage, we see everything through the eyes of God because God is living within us. We are immersed in him and he is immersed in us. I like what Father Cantor Malessa said. He's the preacher to the, the papal household. He said to be immersed in God is like wood that sinks beneath the ocean. The water is in the wood and the wood is in the water. They are both immersed in each other. And that's how it is with us and God in the unitive stage. We need to be immersed in God as God is immersed in us. In fact, the word baptism means immersion because when we are baptized, God himself immerses himself in us. But it's one thing for God to be immersed in us. It's another for us to be immersed in God. When we are immersed in God, that's when our baptism, at our baptism, the Holy Trinity within us overflows within us overflows and overwhelms our faculties, our sensations, our mind, overwhelms us and pours out into one another. That's when the fullness of our baptism really comes to fruition. That's what our baptism is leading us to. Our baptism, the Holy Trinity within us, is leading us to full, total, unconditional union with God himself. The Holy Spirit is leading us to Jesus Christ, to himself, God in us leads us to himself. We get in the way because of our own free will. We restrict God. We send God to the wrong places. We take God into our sins. We withhold God's gifts. God wants to work through us and fully with us. And he wants to use every gift. And he wants to give us as many gifts as we can possibly handle. He wants to give us more gifts, graces than we even know exist. And it's all for the asking. And it's all about being transformed and allowing ourselves to be transformed and not allowing us to fall into despair when the going gets tough, when the prayers get dry, when mass doesn't seem like it's doing anything for us. Don't fall into despair. Persevere. Surrender. Persevere. Look to the saints. Read about the saints and how they experience this. They experience the same things we do because they're human. Padre Pio gave advice to different people and he talks about the dryness of faith. Someone wrote him a letter complaining, I've got dryness of faith. And he said, good, good, because now God is taking you deeper into himself. So it's necessary that we become stripped of ourselves so that we can live completely for God, so that God will be alive in you. So the greatest gift somebody can say to you is God is alive in you. There's no greater compliment than that for people to see you, but see God in you. So where is God right now in your life? Do you know that God is that, that you are experiencing God at the stage, at the purgative stage? Do you feel like God is pulling away from your emotions and then coming back constantly? Do you feel one way with God one minute and then another the next. That's a good thing. He's with you, he's guiding you, but he's drawing you deeper into himself. Or do you feel like God is working on your mind where you're in darkness? You don't really understand where your faith is right now. You're not feeling anything, but there's a darkness. You don't see God in people anymore, in, in the church anymore, in anything anymore. You don't see God in the scriptures. Persevere, you gotta carry on. Don't give up. It's not about what you get out of the scriptures. It's about what God wants you to get out of the scriptures. It's not about the way you want to live your life. It's, the way, it's about the way God wants you to live your life because Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Jesus wants to be your way. He wants to be your truth. He wants to be your life. We just have to let him and know that our emotions are not what's driving us to God, but the Holy Spirit is what's driving us to God. And when our emotions get in the way of that, God's going to get rid of them. He's going to say no more emotions, no more feelings, no more intellect because you're too proud. Knowledge puffs us up, St. Paul says, whereas love builds us up. And God will remove the knowledge that we have. Many people, very, very intelligent people at the end of their life end up saying, 
I don't need any more books. All I need is the Bible. They realize that all they need is to be led by the Holy Spirit in what the Holy Spirit wants them to think. We have to think the way God wants us to think. He gave us a brain, but he is the gift to our brain. So I'd like to finish right now with a gift, with a prayer, and asking God to come into our hearts, come into our minds, to come into our lives in this moment, wherever we are, whatever struggles we have. Heavenly Father, you know us better than we know ourselves. And we know that you are constantly drawing us to yourself. You love us more than we imagine. And you want us to depend upon you and you alone. We know that you don't want us to depend upon our feelings or emotions. You don't want us to depend upon our intelligence or our knowledge. You just want us to depend upon you and your love for us. So we ask that you fill us with your love and increase whatever gifts and graces you want to give us. And we ask that you help us to surrender more to your spirit within us so that we can be overwhelmed by your love, overwhelmed by your spirit, so that when people see us, they see you, and they can say that God is alive in this world because God is alive in us. Lord, we surrender ourselves completely to you. We give you our hearts and we ask that you give us yours. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. I pray God's blessing on and Shalom TV and the work that you do in, in proclaiming the good news of plentiful redemption through the, the, the media. And pray God's blessing also on the audiences, those who, who listen to and, and, and watch your programs. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Shalom World, God's own channel.